And I want to welcome you to Medford United Methodist Church. I thank you for being here with us here this morning. And I also want to welcome this morning uh, Paul Barnett. Paul is uh, one of the young people who grew up in this church, and right now he is in seminary at Princeton Theological Seminary, and we're really happy to have him with us and filling in for Pastor Kathleen today and taking over some of her responsibilities in worship this morning. And we'll have the opportunity to hear a little bit from Paul a little later in the service. But as we're getting started, I encourage each one of you to take a moment. There's a a red attendance pad that's on the inside of the pew. I hope that you'll take and pick that up and pass it down. It's one of the ways that we get to know one another's names. So I hope that you'll pass it down to the end and then back towards the center. And if you are visiting with us today, I hope that you'll take a moment to fill out that section at the bottom where we ask for uh, name and address information. It's one of the ways that we uh, can let you know about things that are going on here at the church, and we'd love to have the opportunity to do that. So we hope that you'll give us that opportunity. And if you'd like to learn more about the church, you can find out more at our website. You can follow us on Facebook. Uh, There's some information out in the hallway. Uh, But certainly, even just by uh, taking a look at the bulletin and uh, reading that through, find out about some of the things that we have going on. And so as we we prepare for worship this morning, I want to lift up a couple of announcements. First of all, we will have a new members class that will be meeting uh, next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock in the evening. And that's going to be here at the church. So next Sunday evening at 6, if you've been looking for a way to take the next step in terms of your connection to the church, we'd love to have you come join us. I encourage you to send us an RSVP uh, to the office. And especially if you need child care, we'd love to know uh, that you're coming. So uh, the second thing I'd like to lift up is today, obviously, is the Super Bowl. Um, And uh, yeah, you know what? I'm not sure if I really care about either one of these teams, um, to be perfectly honest. But... Uh, Nonetheless, this is a day uh, that we have, over the past few years, as a church, participated in something called the Super Bowl of Caring, which is a a program by which young people across the country uh, take part in raising money and collecting food uh, to support food pantries in their local area. And so the food pantry that we support historically has been the Turning Point uh, Food Pantry, which is at one of our sister churches in Trenton. And so we'd love to have your help today and there will be some young people outside collecting money today, specifically money to support uh, the ministry of the Turning Point uh, Food Pantry and we'd love to have your donation for that. Uh, We also have been talking for the past couple weeks about helping the homeless with hygiene kits and so uh, we have a little video that we'd love to show you about how to do that and what that looks like. So I ask you to take a look at this. Let's make a shoebox that will benefit a life. For a girl, for a boy, for a woman, or for a man. What do they need? Everybody needs socks and underwear, um, a toothbrush and a toothpaste, shampoo, conditioner, and a comb, lotion, soap, and a washcloth. And the adults need shaving cream? Deodorant and razor. Wait, where are all the razors? What, what have you been doing? I kind of need that one. Sorry. That took me an hour. Then you take your shoebox. You wrap it with a rubber band. And you label it. Now, now you, you have, have an, an iPod, iPod shoebox. Shoe yeah. Right. So we want to thank, uh, I want to thank the kids for putting that together, and Mr. Carl as well, and Takazuski. We want to thank Ann for uh, putting that together and editing that. That's great. So we thank all of you. Um, and one more way that you can help uh, the homeless is this week, actually, today, our uh, guests through with the Interfaith Hospitality Network are going to be arriving here at the church, and they'll be staying here for a week. And so we have some needs uh, during that week for some help in some different areas. And particularly, we have some needs for some overnight hosts and also for some uh, evening and uh, mealtime hosts. And so you can sign up for those uh, time slots just right outside these doors on your way out the front doors. You can take a look to your left. There will be a place where you can sign up. So I encourage you to take a look and see what places are available. And uh, maybe there's something for you. And we'd love to have your help with that as well. I think those are all the announcements I want to share right at the moment. So Paul, will you lead us in the... Oh, (laughs) we're not going to do that. You guys are going to play. I forgot.
job. Very nicely done. I ask that you would stand and join with me in the call to worship. We gather on a day like any other day. We gather, we gather on a day unlike any other day. Come, brothers and sisters in Christ, touch and feel and taste and smell the sacred moment that is today. For this is the day which our Creator God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. You may be seated. <coughs> Join with me in the unison prayer. <clears throat> Breathe in us, O Holy Spirit, that our thoughts may all be holy. Act in us, O Holy Spirit, that our work too may be holy. Draw our hearts, O Holy Spirit, that we may love but what is holy. Strengthen us, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard us then, O Holy Spirit, that we always may be holy. Amen. God offers us sisters and brothers in Christ to share our burdens and to complete the tasks set before us. Praise God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Stand and join and uh, share the peace of Christ.
like to invite the kids up for children's time. Tim, hi Bradley, hello. How are you guys this morning? Great. Great. This first day of chimes, right? I like seeing you playing. You look you're very good. All right. So you guys know how to do a lot of things, right? Yeah. yeah. Did you like know how to do them right away when you were born? You knew everything? Yeah? yeah? No. no, yeah. Basically? All right, well, for the common folks, some of us need to learn how to do everything that we do, right? So who taught you like your letters and your sounds and your, your teachers taught you that and your numbers? Basically my mom, she's a Your mom, she's a first grade and teacher, so that works out. And my mom, because she's a preschool teacher. She's a preschool teacher, so your teachers and your mom. What about like how to play a sport? Oh, my, the, those teachers. Those teachers. The teachers that do that. The teachers who do that. I think I teach you. What are those people called? Uh, like a like a coach, coach. A coach. Uh, what about how to ride a bike? Kind of like a sensei, yeah. To do karate. What about like riding a bike, tying your shoes? Mom, did your dad do anything? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and your dad. What about you, Bradley? Did mom and dad teach you? Yeah, so mom and dad, maybe grandma and grandpa, your teachers. So there's lots of really special people in our lives that help us learn how to do all the things that we know how to do now. So did those same people teach you about God? Yes. Yeah, so we have those same people to teach us about God, too. And there's, these special people are called mentors. So there are a lot of stories in the Bible about people mentoring others or being mentored. And without these special people, we would not know about God and how to serve him. So, but you and I can be mentors for others by the way that we act and treat others. So if we're tre treating, way, treating others the way that, we, that Jesus taught us, then we're being a mentor for others and for God. So we can be a mentor for the world by going out into the world and being nice to others and spreading God's word, even if it's just with one person. That one person could turn around and do it to somebody else and then somebody else. So we don't have to change the whole world, maybe just one person. We all can be mentors today when we go out into the world. So let's pray before we go back to our seats. Repeat after me. Dear God. Thank you for the special mentors we have in our lives. Thank you for the special mentors we have in our lives. Help us to be a mentor for others. Help us to be a mentor for others. By the way we treat others. By the way we treat others. When we go into the world. Amen. Thanks for coming up, guys. <laughs>
reading this morning is from the Second Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gigal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, yes, I know, be silent. Then Elisha said to him, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water and the water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me, as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, but when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other and Elisha went over. When the company of prophets who were at Jericho saw him at a distance, they declared, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, amen. So today we come to the conclusion of our series about faith and work that we've been doing for the past few weeks. And uh, today, uh, just as a reminder, let me mention first, you know, you can always catch up on sermons that you may have missed. You can see them on our website. And uh, so I hope that you'll take the opportunity to catch up. Uh, you can also read them if you don't want to watch them. You can also uh, read through the manuscript there, which gets posted every week. But we've covered a lot of ground, important ground, I think, over the past few weeks. And we've talked about vocation. We talked about handling success and failure. We talked about integrity. We talked about leadership. And I think this week is actually a bit of a continuation of last week in some, in some sense. And that we're going to continue to talk about a dimension of leadership, which to me is really important. And that is mentoring and mentoring relationships. So why don't we begin with a word of prayer. I invite you to pray with me. God, we thank you for your work in our lives. We thank you for the way that you bless us with your presence, that you fill us with your spirit. And we pray that you would surround us now with encouragement, with hope, with love. Help us to know um, what it is that you were saying to us this morning. We're grateful for all that you've done. 
and pray a blessing upon our hearing and in our, in our understanding here this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We might not think about it all that often, but as uh, Kelsey said a little earlier, mentoring is a concept that we find throughout the Bible. It's repeated over and over, and the most obvious of which is in Jesus' relationship with the 12 disciples. They follow him, according to John's chronology, about three years. And so as he's calling them, they're following him, seeing what it is that he's teaching, how it is that he's ministering to people. They watch him healing. And then there comes a time when Jesus sends them out to do this work themselves. And we hear, the Bible doesn't pull any punches about this. We hear both about their successes and their failures. And what I find interesting, there are a couple of stories about this. First, that involve the 12. And then another story that involves Jesus sending out 72 disciples. Kind of the only time these 72, kind of a broader, bigger group of followers is talked about. And as he's describing... Um, what they're going to encounter as they go out into the world. It almost reads as though a set of FAQs, frequently asked questions. You know, what are we going to encounter when we go out there? And Jesus is seeking to meet every one of their objections. And I have to believe that somewhere down in that list of objections is, but wait, you're not coming with us, right? The biggest objection of all. And Jesus' response, at least the way that I read this story and understand this story, is basically, no, I think I'm going to stay here and I'll pray for you. And I take that away because when they come back and they offer this report about what they've seen and what they've heard, this is all in Luke chapter 10. They're thrilled at the success that they've had. But also along the way, surely they had some failures. But Jesus' response is, yes, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. So it's clear that Jesus has been following them spiritually and praying for them and asking for God's blessing upon them as they've gone out and done this work. And then he says to them, why don't you tell me all about it? And already they're starting to tell him about it. He says, come away. We'll spend some time and we'll talk about these things and we'll pray together. So there's this idea that Jesus sends them out into the world, they come back, they report, and then Jesus says, now, let's go talk about it. What went well? What went poorly? So in every one of these apprenticeship kind of relationships, you may have heard this idea before, the idea of uh, see one, do one, teach one. So the concept that if you're apprenticed to someone, you watch what they're doing for a time, then you have the opportunity to do it yourself while somebody's standing over your shoulder to be able to guide you. And then when you get good enough, the next step is you've got to learn how to teach it to someone else. And that's how we know you've really gotten it down. You've really mastered it. And it strikes me that this is exactly the way that Jesus taught the disciples. See one, do one, teach one. As a society, these mentoring relationships... We recognize them as important, but I don't think we recognize them as being important enough. And there are a couple reasons for that. But if you really stop right now and think about people who have meant something to you in your own life as mentors, really pause right now and think about how they've affected you. Outside of your family, some of your best friends, your spouse, I would be willing to bet that a handful of mentors have actually meant more to the trajectory of your life than just about any other relationship that you've had. Think about that. So why don't we celebrate these relationships more? Why don't we talk about them more? Why don't we encourage this kind of mentoring? more and more. Why isn't it something that we value above all other things? Well, I think there are a couple reasons for that. The first one is, 
you know what? We like to have the idea that we did this all ourselves. That's a really important concept that we have. It's a particularly American kind of concept. I did this myself, and it's important. But at the same time, we have to recognize that it's never exactly true. Because there's always someone who's been with you to walk with you, to teach you, to lead you, to guide you. Always. The second reason I think that we don't celebrate these enough is because frequently they're very short-term kinds of relationships that last only through a season of our lives. They may be a couple of years, They may only be actually a couple of months, but we should never underestimate how much change we can bring into somebody's life, how much guidance we can bring into somebody's life if we enter in as a mentor at exactly the right time when they need someone to guide them through. You should never underestimate it. Like I said, Jesus was with the disciples for how long? It's three years. And in those three years, they learned everything, kind of, that they needed to know in order to be able to carry on doing the work that he had called them to do. I actually think that movies tell these kinds of stories better than even our own memories. So if you think about some of your favorite movies, do not many of them have this kind of relationship between this wise elder and somebody who's just getting started? So think about, most recently, you can talk about the Harry Potter movies, right? And the relationship between Harry Potter and Dumbledore, right? That's a pretty good example of mentoring. You can think a little bit farther back, and you can talk about maybe um, um, so Matt, the Matt Damon movie, Good Will Hunting. Do you remember that movie? Uh, or going back a little further, you can talk about the Karate Kid, right? Mr. Miyagi, wax on, wax off, right? Um, pretty classic. But for my money, of course, it's about Yoda and Luke Skywalker, right? It's got to be. I remember seeing this movie for the first time and seeing this little green guy. You know, he's a Muppet in the, uh, in the Empire Strikes Back. George Lucas one time described him as the illegitimate offspring of... Uh, Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy, actually. <laughs> and his picture is here. Actually, the hair was, was drawn from um, looking at pictures of Albert Einstein. So Yoda. Luke meets this great Jedi master. He, he knows that he, he's told by Ben Kenobi, another one of his mentors, that he needs to go and seek out Yoda. And so he has in his mind, I'm looking for this big, strong guy. Apparently, Obi-Wan never told him. You're looking for a little green dude about this tall, right? Never told him that. He shows up on this swamp planet, and he runs into this little goblin-like creature who knows who he is, but he doesn't know who Yoda is. And so part of this meeting is a test. Yoda doesn't really believe that Luke is ready for this. And so part of the testing is, Yoda pretends to be just kind of a fool. A great warrior you seek, yes, right? And all of these things. And I remember the first time I saw the movie, just like, who is this guy? What is this about, right? But it turns out that this is exactly the teacher that Luke was seeking, the person he needed to run into. He doesn't believe that Luke is ready, which annoys Luke to no end. And Luke pushes back and keeps saying, but I am ready, but I am ready, but I am ready, which annoys Yoda to no end. Yoda finally says, I've been doing this for 800 years, kid. I'll decide who's ready and who's not ready. And we learn in this moment And we see it even more in the terrible prequels, right? Um, Just how Jedi are made through this apprenticeship process. Two people are paired together. They go out. They do the work of the Jedi, which is basically to keep order in the galaxy, right? To fight for good. And then they come back, and they talk about how things went. 
It's very biblical, this model. And it's not just kind of a debriefing about technically how did everything go. It's also about how did that feel? What was that like for you? So you have these two people who travel together, who work together, who rely on each other. And then they come back and they share how did that go? How did that feel? It's this unique kind of relationship that we have with mentors. If we have someone good, one of the things that's kind of funny about that relationship is if we have somebody who's really good, chances are they've done this before. So I know that for me, I've been fortunate to have some really wonderful mentors. But one of the things that, that makes that relationship a little hard is when you are somewhere with your mentor and you realize suddenly that they're not just your mentor, but they mentored all these other people too. And now suddenly you feel like, oh, am I as good as that person? Am I as special as that person? Which is another reason why I think we don't celebrate these relationships enough, is because we feel a little insecure about them. We always wonder, are we as special to the one who's mentoring us as they are in our hearts? So when we get to uh, The Return of the Jedi, the next movie where Yoda appears after Empire Strikes Back. Yoda is about ready to die. He's been alive 900 years. God knows that, you know, it's, you know, can't live forever, right? Even a Jedi. So he's about ready to become one with the Force in the language of that galaxy, right? And so he imparts some final wisdom to Luke. And in that moment, you just have this incredible sadness. It's, it's incredibly sad for Luke, and it's incredibly sad for the viewer as you watch it. And it's really not at all unlike what's happening in today's scripture with Elijah and Elisha. So Elijah, one of the greatest prophets that's ever been known in Israel, done amazing and miraculous things. Even in this story, he parts the water with his cloak, kind of as a reminder of and he takes the same path that Israel took in crossing over into the promised land. Elisha is his mentee, this man that has been chosen among all the people of Israel to pick up and follow along where Elijah himself has left off. And Elijah finds Elisha in the oddest of places. He finds him plowing in a field. And as Elijah walks by, he says, God says to him, this is the person that you've got to go and tap. This is the next one of you. And so Elijah comes and he puts his cloak on Elisha as Elisha is plowing in this field with these, it says 12 yoke of oxen. So nobody plows with 12 yoke of oxen, right? That's 24 oxen. I love that word, such a strange plural, right? 24. Who's wealthy enough to plow with 24 ox? Right? This guy's got tons of money. And he obviously has tons of land, too, because to turn that many at the end of the row, can you imagine what that's like? That can't be very much fun. Right? And Elisha's taken aback. But his only question is, can I go and say goodbye to my mom and dad? That's all he asks. And then, as a mark of his commitment, his full commitment to what Elijah is calling him to do, he slaughters the oxen, they cook them, and they invite everybody from miles around. That's a lot to eat, right? Invites everybody from miles around to come and have a celebration. And then he gets up in the morning and he follows Elijah. And he does this for probably about four years. What's interesting is we never hear any more about his story in between the time when he is called and the day that he departs from Elijah's side. But we do have this really deep sense in which this day is incredibly painful for Elisha. 
This is probably one of the hardest stories in the Bible for me to read. Because when I hear it, I just feel that sadness. These prophets, they keep running into, as they travel from place to place, they keep running into prophets. And everybody, everybody that they hang out with knows this is the day that Elijah is going to heaven. Everybody knows. I'm not sure how they know. Elijah's probably been talking about it. But they know. And so they come to Elisha and they say, you know that today's the day, right? And all Elisha can do is say, I know. I don't want to talk about it. There's this pain, this incredible sense of pain and loss in those words. I know. Keep silent. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt that when someone who has mentored you and seen you through some difficult times and encouraged you has maybe left the company, moved on to a new position, maybe gotten sick, maybe you're the one who's moved on and you've left them behind? That's hard. As I go through life, I pray for a couple things. One of the things I pray for is that there will always be people who will be willing to invest in me. That's important. I want to know that there's somebody who's willing to make an investment in me. But I also want to know that there's somebody coming behind me whom I can invest in. So that I know that this doesn't end when I end here on earth. But that it keeps going. I'm incredibly proud of the people who have mentored me. I mean, I'm proud to be able to say I was mentored by, right? That to me holds a great deal of meaning. And I hope it does for them too. But I'm also very proud to be able to look at the people that I have mentored and know that some of them are going to be much better pastors than I could ever be. comes a day when the student surpasses the teacher. And that might make us uncomfortable. And that's actually, I think, too, one of the reasons why we don't 100% trust these kinds of relationships, because it makes us uncomfortable to train our successors. It makes us uncomfortable to know that the person that we're working with may someday be our boss. But there's something interesting and biblical about that, too. So if you look at John chapter 14, one of the things that Jesus says is, those who have faith will do even greater things than these. Meaning, he's pointing to his own works. Those who have faith will do even greater things than I have done. That's what Jesus says. So it shouldn't be any surprise, and it shouldn't shock us, that the people that we mentor will become greater than we are. That's how it's meant to be. I don't know if Elijah knows that when he taps Elisha, but... In many measures, it's true. So apprenticeship is the model of the Jedi, but it's also the model of the scriptures that we watch, and then we do, and then we teach. This is how the cycle is meant to work. It's how Jesus grew the very first leaders of the church by investing in those who would come after him. So I want to leave you with a few questions to think about, and it's a challenge, really. First, I want you to consider, who are the people who have made investments in you? Who are they? What would you say that they contributed to your life? How is your life different because of what they did? Have you thanked them? Have you, at the very minimum, thanked God for them? And then secondly, I want you to consider this. Who are you investing in? Leaders know that the world needs more leaders, that we need better leaders. People can help us to move forward. I don't care who you are or what you think you know. Every Yoda 
needs a Luke Skywalker, and every Elijah needs an Elisha. Leaders understand that great leadership isn't just born into people, but it's mentored into people. It comes by walking with someone who's going to come after you. So watch and do and teach. That's the model that the Jedi followed. That's the model that Jesus follows. That's the model we carry out into the world. Amen? seated. Paul, I'll invite you to come and join me over here. Sure. So maybe you know this and maybe you don't, but one of the major components of our budget each year is the 73 or so thousand dollars, 73 thousand dollars this year that we send to support the work of the United Methodist Church, not only here in New Jersey, but in 136 countries around the world. And um, the work that we talk about the United Methodist Church doing, like training a new generation of leaders, sometimes can seem very abstract. And it's tough, you know, sometimes to wrap our heads around, okay, what does that money go and do? What do we actually accomplish with it? Well, today we have the opportunity really to celebrate one very concrete way in which this gift that we send out comes back to us. And that is by celebrating and recognizing Paul because Paul is receiving a scholarship to attend uh, Princeton Seminary through uh, the United Methodist Church, specifically the Greater Board of Higher Education and Ministry. And that money that comes back to Paul to help him pay his tuition comes in part through the offerings that we send. So we just wanna celebrate that today. And actually I have a uh, certificate that uh, we received here at the church from Nashville, from the general board, and uh, we want to uh, present this to Paul in recognition and celebration of what God's doing in your life, and we want to thank you uh, for having encouraged to follow the call, and we want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to support you in that. So let's give God thanks. Thank so let's continue now by offering God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Join with me in the prayer of dedication. We long to be led in the, in the church, church, in business, in, business, in government, government, by people who are willing to invest in us. We long for the wisdom of elders who have been through this before. We long for insight and experience to stretch our own thinking and to keep us calm in the face of challenges. Lord, help us as a church to raise up new leaders, and to be willing to invest our time, energy, and resources to help them grow into the followers you created them to be. Bless these gifts that people may hear and follow Christ's call on their lives. Amen. You may be seated. Before I uh, plunge into the prayer, I have two notes. Uh, so there's going to be a couple times where, uh, during the prayer, where I'm going to name God and then list a characteristic of God, uh, and you'll respond with, hear our prayer. So for instance, I might say, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll respond with, hear our prayer. Okay. Uh, and then in the middle of this prayer, um, I'm going to say, we lift these, our concerns, up to you. And at that point, uh, if you feel led, you can vocalize a prayer request that you might have. Um, or uh, lift it up uh, in your mind. So, let's pray. <clears throat> God of beauty, who set the seasons and stars in motion, we thank you for this planet that sustains and nourishes. As the rain and the snow falls onto the ground, as the plants prepare to emerge from the soil, and as we see and hear the wildlife about us, all creation sings of your majesty. Beautiful one, in your generosity, hear our prayer. God of might, who sent your son to make the lame walk and to make the blind see, we approach you with our burdens, our sorrows, and our pain. We cannot bear these things alone, thus we approach you, not that we may be independent of you, but that we are drawn ever closer. We lift these, our concerns, up to you. Almighty, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wisdom, whose truths are boundless and unfathomable, God of peace, who sent your Son to exorcise demons and to free us from the condemnation of death, we implore you for your reconciling touch. We have seen friendships ended and wars started at the behest of what we pass off as sophistication and truth, but all it really is is obscene platitude. 
God, continue to invite us into the depths of your wisdom that we may learn humility and the embrace of your peace that we may walk in the way of your Son. God wise and God peaceful in your sensibility, hear our prayer. Now, God, together with these petitions, we pray the phrases that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. As we prepare to celebrate here around the table, I want to remind you once again that this table does not belong to the United Methodist Church, but it belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's the one who issues the invitation. That invitation is to all people who seek to live in a new relationship with God and with their neighbor through Him. So as we come today, we'll come by the center aisle, return by the side aisles, and as you come forward, I invite you to be in prayer for that person in front of you so that each person could be prayed over individually this morning. And um, if you cannot come forward for whatever reason, please let us know. We'll make sure to bring the elements to you. And uh, all the elements that we're using today uh, will be gluten-free. So that's uh, not something that you need to worry about if that's an allergy that you have. So let's continue now with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who walked with the twelve, who taught them, who showed them by his example, and then mentored and led them, encouraged them, generation by generation, until we come to us today here in this place. We give thanks that by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, Lord, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. We remember how on the night before Jesus gave himself up for us, how he took bread, how he gave thanks to you, and then how he broke the bread and shared it with his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And how likewise, when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, how he gave thanks to you, and shared it with his disciples, saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Now pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Hosanna in the 
Invite those who are going to be serving with us this morning to come forward.
Lord of us all, we thank you for communion. We thank you for the gift of bread, the body of your son. We are reminded of his bodily presence on earth and his bodily sacrifice for our sins. We thank you for the gift of the cup, the, ble- uh, bre- uh, the, the blood of your son. We are reminded of his blood shed for us, but also the life given us. Last, we thank you for the communion table where we meet in community to share the gifts of bread and cup. It is at this place where our limited human unworthiness is rendered worthy in your face. In your name and in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. remind you that our young people are at the door and they are waiting uh, for your donations to the Turning Point Food Pantry. I'll also remind you that if you would like to, re- uh, to receive some chocolate covered pretzels, today's the last day to put in your orders, so we encourage you to do that. And as you go forth from this place, go forth knowing that Christ goes with you. Go forth to be investing in those who will come behind you in order to make the world a place where leadership might be recognized, a place where Christian leaders might be encouraged, a place where we might learn to solve our problems together. Go forth to invest in someone because you know that someone is invested in you. Go forth in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>